These programs, which initially started as a way to pull people up, have now been transformed through the magic of messaging and dog whistle politics as actually a way to hold people down. Just listen to the way right-wing media refers to people living in poverty. True poverty is being driven by personal behavior, not an unfair economic system. In 1963, just 6% of American babies were born out of wedlock. Now, 41% are, and that includes 72% of African-American babies. That's right, blame the victim and toss in a little racially charged language while you're at it. As author Ian Lopez describes in his new book, Dog Whistle Politics, quote, campaigning for President Ronald Reagan liked to tell stories of Cadillac driving welfare queens and strapping young bucks, buying T-bone steaks with food stamps. In flogging these tales about the perils of welfare run amok, Reagan always denied any racism and emphasized he never mentioned race. He didn't need to because he was blowing a dog whistle. Joining me now, Ian Lopez the author of Dog Whistle Politics, and Heather McGee, Vice President of Policy and Outreach at Demos. Thanks to you both for joining me. So, Ian, I want to start with you and just talk about the book a bit in terms of this idea of, because we've seen, you know, in, it's just this week where we had this conversation about the war on poverty, it seems to very well fit with the premise that you make in terms of where we saw this shift in our history to more of the, this dog whistle politics. Absolutely. Here's the basic point. In order for people to have a path out of poverty, in order for the middle class to thrive, we need a government that's geared towards helping the middle class, not a government geared towards helping the rich. But in order to have that, we need to stop being divided by race. And how are we being divided by race? We're being divided by race through a new sort of racial, co uh, racial rhetoric that operates in code. So things like welfare cheats, um, uh, things like illegal aliens, these are terms that are operating like dog whistles. Right. On one level, you can't hear the race because there's no surface reference to race. On the other, they're triggering tremendous racial anxiety. And what they're doing is they're making people afraid of minorities, but also afraid of government. And the result is we have a lot of the American public who sees that the takers in their lives are poor minorities mm -hmm. rather than it being the 1% and the big corporations, right? We need to change that. And Heather, that's, I mean, that rhetoric also we're seeing, you know, efforts at the state level to drug test people who might be on welfare or shame children like with stamps on their hands who are eligible for free lunch mm -hmm. programs. I mean, there's all sorts of efforts we're seeing at the state and local level that reinforces this very messaging and yet race is not mentioned. Absolutely. And it's, it's a really uh, frustrating moment we're in because you look at the things that actually have caused this record economic insecurity and inequality, and it really is all about the right-wing trickle-down economic agenda. And yet, people like Mitt Romney, who really sort of personified the sort of billionaire plutocrat who didn't care at all about, you know, people like us and the 47%, are able to get a majority of white support from working and middle class people who nevertheless were responsive to the fact that he was running anti-welfare ads mm -hmm. on the president when welfare was not even a political right. issue. You know, Ian, one of the things that strikes me, uh, you talk about the Tea Party, but it, you know, so the Tea Party movement is a movement obviously in and of itself. At the same time, it feels like uh, it's part of a larger historical context of movements that come along when the status quo feels threatened. And certainly the Tea Partiers wouldn't think of themselves as the status quo, but as you see the rise of, you know, we're becoming a minority, majority country, right. there, right. and you know, you have more gays and lesbians, people marrying. I mean, the rule, the quote unquote rules are changing right. in such a way, immigration, that the status quo really feels threatened. Is that part of the point in your book? I think that's part of the point, but I'd frame it slightly differently. I'd say a lot of the people in the Tea Party, they are threatened, but they're not threatened by minorities. They're threatened by an economy that has stopped serving the poor, the working class, the middle class. But they need an, a way to understand what's happening in their lives. Why are wages declining? Why is our public schools no good anymore? Why is the infrastructure deteriorating? They need a way to understand it. Now, conservatives have given them a way to understand it. Conservatives say, blame minorities. I think it's up to the to liberals to say, this is not about minorities. We will all move forward together as soon as we stop being divided by race. But there are people who are making us worse off, and it's the very rich who think that the game should be rigged in their favor. Right. Well, I think the challenge is a fascinating book. I think the challenge is, as you point out, that because these phrases have changed, the phraseology and the messaging has changed, it's harder to sort of point it out when you see it happening. I have got my dog whistle. Get yours. Thank you, Ian Lopez and Heather McGee. Thank you, Karen. Thank you.